Morning. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> We're studying the covenants. And I think we, uh, we finished the covenant with uh, Noah. And that covenant's going to extend clear through the millennium, at least parts of it are. A good majority of it is. And then we come to the next covenant, which is the Abrahamic covenant. Now, we covered a lot of this when we talked about uh, rightly dividing between the Jew, the Gentile, and the church. So I'm, I'm going to cover it quickly because... Just a few weeks ago, we, we talked about the difference between a Jew and a Gentile, and in doing that, we talked about the Abrahamic Covenant. Uh, the Abrahamic Covenant is in three, three different sections in your Bible, not section, but different places, because it covers three different things. And the first one's in Genesis chapter 12. <coughs> in Genesis chapter 12, and that's going to deal uh, with the fact that he's going to make them a great nation. Now, the, the thing that's uh, about the Abrahamic covenant is God's going to make three promises to Abraham, and there's no strings attached. Now, this is very instructive to the Christian uh, when somehow you feel the need to throw the Jew aside and steal his blessings. We call that British Israelism. And there's a lot of that going around. Uh, if you're post-millennial in your theology, uh, you're going to be stealing promises that are made to that Jew. Because you don't have Christ coming back, and uh, you think the church is going to rule or somehow, and there's no, no way that's going to happen. Uh, we're a rescue operation. That's all we are, man. Get them saved and let's get out of here. So um, it's important that you understand that. <clears throat> There's no strings attached to this. Now, God, God can, he can determine at what point he fulfills those promises. And there were some stipulations involved of when, but never a problem of if. They will happen. Uh, for God to make these promises to Abraham, he will bring them to pass sooner or later. In uh, Genesis 12, 1 to 3, he says, Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. That's true. Most uh, Jews were a blessing to this nation. Had not been for their efforts in World War I, uh, and even in, uh, well, I don't know about the Second World War. They were pretty much on, the, on their heels then. But during World War I, they were very helpful. I think they were even helpful during the Revolution. If I'm not mistaken, they were... Um, they helped give money to support uh, the colonies here in America, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's the reason why we have that, uh, uh, the Jewish star on the back of our dollar bill. You'll find a uh, Star of David. It's not really a Star of David, but we'll call it that. It's actually the Star of their God, Ren fan, but we won't talk about that today either. Anyway, but um, he says, I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Well, through Jesus Christ, that's true, isn't it? Salvation has gone to the ends of the earth through a Jew. So in, in that respect, all nations. It says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land... And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So automatically we already have an altar set up. Doesn't say he sacrificed. I think it's kind of, I'm assuming that he did. But we already have a sacrifice associated with this covenant. But we're not done yet. There's uh, more to go. Re um, Genesis chapter 13. So we have him the promise of a great nation. He's mentioned the land. Uh, he's going to go a little bit farther than that in chapter 13. In verse 14 to 17, And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes. Uh, he, he, he automatically knew which, <laughs> which way Lot was going. You know. Lord, Lord knows when you got that look in your eye, you know, where um, it's dollar signs. He knows which way you're going to choose. He says now, uh, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place 
where thou art, where thou art, where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, and for all the land which thou seest, uh, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Okay, that's the land grant. Now he later on he defines that land grant of reaching from Egypt all the way to the Euphrates, and that'll just about take you to India. Uh, a, a vast portion of the Middle East belongs to the Jew. I think even three quarters of Saudi Arabia, uh, I don't know how many, of the, I, I'm not very good at geography, but a lot of those nations up there like um, Syria and all them, uh, that's Jewish territory. So what that Jew has now they're disputing over, there's no dispute. God gave that to them. And uh, if you want to be a Bible rejecter, just side with the Palestinians. Uh, you'll even find where uh, some of that uh, land was bought and paid for by David. It's only, it's only mentioned in the Bible two or three times. And yet that Arab's got his, uh, uh, one of his mosques sitting right on that site. They got a school there, I believe, too. And uh, <clears throat> they're trespassing. Now, you can believe whatever you want, but you know what? God's going to give whatever he wants to give to whomever he wants. He can even give it to the devil if he wants to. And at one time he did. Because in Matthew 4, the devil's saying, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you all these nations. Well, you can't give something you don't have. But after the Lord came up from the dead, guess who, guess who has claimed all the nations now? He's just going to come back and claim them. So, <clears throat> United Nations, would, if, if America wasn't on, if we didn't have our veto vote, uh, the United Nations would have already voted those Jews right off that land. So you know what I think of the United Nations? Very little. <laughs> and, and, and the Lord could, what are they? They're the dust on the scale. They're the drop in the bucket. They're less than nothing. So that's kind of how I feel about them too. What's that? The circle with the rings <laughs> yeah. I'll have to think about that one. I will make thy seed, verse 16, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise and walk uh, through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So turn to chapter 15. We'll see the third part of this. Um, no, actually, they're both mentioned there he, where he's going to multiply the seed. I don't know if he mentions it again here. Let's read down through here. Um, chapter 15, starting at verse 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. There's that. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst <clears throat> and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. So he's prepared this sacrifice on this altar. And um, I can't explain that, uh, what's going to happen here. I don't know if I understand it. I don't know. It, there's something about it I, I can't figure out. It says, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Now, and we know that that's Egypt. So evidently this, uh, this horror that he's talking about uh, of darkness has to do with their captivity uh, in Egypt. And I've explained that four hundred years to you uh, once before if you pay attention about um, uh, Usher's chronology. If all you got to do is go over to Exodus 12, where he talks about 430 years, and then just go back 430 years from that, that date, and you'll land on Genesis 12. And in Genesis 12, Abraham is down in Egypt, and Pharaoh's after his woman. And when you persecute Abraham, you persecute all 12 tribes. Why? They're in the loins of Abraham, according to Hebrews chapter 7. So that's the 400 years, and it actually ends up being 430, but 
He said, they're down there 430 or 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Ammonites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark. And then it says, Behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Other than just, you know, usually there's fire comes down out of heaven, consumes the sacrifice. Here it's something a little different. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know if I've ever heard um, anybody comment on it. It's just kind of strange the way, it, first there's this darkness, it's like a horror, it's like he's in a horror film. And then all of a sudden these pieces, there's a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passes between those pieces. But he says in 18, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. So where, there we have our sacrifice. Uh, remember, all these covenants are made by sacrifice. Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt. There you have it. Unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And that's a, a, a large portion of the Middle East. So you have a sacrifice in verse 17 and 18. The terms of the covenant is there are three promises with no conditions. Abraham is given a land grant from Egypt to the Euphrates, which would include, and I've got some, some Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, half of Iraq, all of Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. So somebody alert the Arabs. <laughs> Said, guess what? You're moving. <laughs> and they will. And I know what they're going to say. You know, they scream, scream to high heaven. And that's what the, the world does. They scream to high heaven. Racism, you know, and, and genocide. And, but they don't have any problem doing those things. Um, I mean, they, they don't mind killing folks off, but when the Lord says, look, are you going to actually argue with God on what's His? You're going you're to tell the Creator, you're going to tell Him, you're wrong. Really? I want to be there when you do it. I want to watch. <laughs> From a distance, just in case you splatter. <laughs> Abraham is given a promise of a physical seed. And Abraham is given promise of a great nation. The termination of this covenant, covenant is never. There are no conditions. No, it's never going to terminate. This promise is to them. Even in the new heaven and new earth, these things will exist. Probably a much larger land grant. But a um, uh, preacher, used to, uh, he, he taught this when we, he was talking about Abraham's bosom. He said, think of it that the Jew's going to wind up with the earth. You know, you, know, you know how you know that? When he calls the center of the earth Abraham's bosom. The whole earth is going to belong to Abraham and his seed. And so the earth is for the Jew, just as the, um, the uh, new Jerusalem is for the church, and the new heavens is for the Gentile. That they're just going to keep expanding and expanding. I think the new earth will be much larger than this one. You, know, you never notice how, like, how big Jupiter is? I think we can fit inside Jupiter, uh, is it my no? 83 times or something like that? Or maybe that's the sun. But I mean, we fit inside Jupiter. I'm thinking, Lord could have made this place a lot bigger. So why wouldn't he? I mean, you might be able to have, it might be able to house a trillion Jews on this planet. Who knows? But now those, other, those Jews are going to be sent forth to govern those other planets, don't you know? There's always going to be room. And you're, you're already thinking about population explosion and how we're going to, no problem. It says of the increase of his government, there is no end. Yeah. You see, he just makes space. You say, how's he going to, I don't know. You say, how's he going to maintain it? I don't know how. <laughs> just know he is. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the mosaic. That's the Abraham, uh, Abrahamic covenant. Covenant. Talk about the mosaic. Exodus chapter 19. It says, Exodus chapter 19, starting verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed. See, there's a stipulation on this one. With Abraham, there was no stipulations. But on this one, it says, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant... 
Then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is whose? Mine. The Lord says it's mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See, in the millennium, all of the Jews are, they're, they're, a, they're, a, they're a priesthood of believers, like it's applied to us in this age, but it, it will be a nation of, of, it's a priest nation, and they are the ones that are going to make intercession for Israel, uh, uh, for the rest of the world before the throne of God in Jerusalem. Yes, sir. Yes. Yep. And a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, uh oh, <laughs> that's what I put in there. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Oh. How about all that the Lord has spoken by the grace of God and, and, and God's power and might, we will try to do. <laughs> and Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. You tell us and we'll do it. Maybe you said that to God a few times. You just tell me, Lord, and I'll do it. Sure, you sure about that? Really? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's what was stated here was good intentions. <laughs> good intentions. Now that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, and I, well, I mean, I think that when the conditions are, are perfect, it's easy to promise God anything. But the conditions never stay constant. It's when the conditions go upside down on you and then that little promise you made to God. That's why you don't want to, I don't do any kind of oath thing. I took one, yeah, I never, I never swear an oath. I mean, I'm talking about to God, you know, uh, and, the, and the reason being is I did it once and the devil liked to broke my back over it because he hears everything you're swearing. And God takes no pleasure in fools. I mean, if, if you promise it to God, you should deliver it. And you, don't you know the devil is going to give you all, all kinds of trouble if you do that? And, of course, these Jews, you know, all that thou tell us, we will do. And next thing you know, man, he puts them through a couple trials. And sometimes you're... <clears throat> Your, your, your flesh causes your mouth to sin and say something you, you shouldn't have told the Lord. Now, like I said, there's always good intentions. But after a little while of being saved and realizing, and I believe the Lord's very gracious to us, I know that, we'd all be dead. Some of the stuff we pulled, seriously. I mean, if Ananias and Sapphira, if that was still true today, is it with me? <laughs> So, you learn, but you also learn that, you know, when you make God a promise, uh, you better be aware that somebody else heard it too, and he's going to try to upset that thing. Best thing to do is, by the grace of God, if God will, that way you cover yourself. Um, he said, Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So, he gives them this covenant uh, look at Leviticus chapter 9. And of course, if you're reading through the, Pente uh, the Pentateuch uh, from Genesis to Deuteronomy, actually from Exodus to Deuteronomy, you start seeing all the different laws that they're given. Uh, system of sacrifice, everything's, everything's there. And it culminates here. Remember, we, we, we always usually have a sacrifice with a covenant. In Leviticus 9, verse 23 and 24, it says, And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. 
I don't know if they're shouting glory, hallelujah, or, oh my God, <laughs> they hit the floor. But one thing's for sure, they, they go down. Because they have just witnessed this, you know, fire from heaven consume this sacrifice on a Sunday day. And the Mosaic Covenant went into force. Blood of bulls and goats. But it's a, a covenant of law. And because it's a covenant of law, well, the law is instituted. It involves the priesthood, the sacrifices, the holy days, dietary laws, everything including building um, code. It, it, it covers a lot of different things. <clears throat> They're under this thing, and he's telling them that it includes the Abrahamic land grant, not if they get it, but when. The Mosaic Covenant says, look, if you obey these things, you're going to get this land grant. He promises it to them. And they nearly succeed in getting, I don't know if they get all of it. They get pretty close under uh, when they finally get to Solomon. They get pretty, pretty close to getting most of it. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. So there's terms to this covenant, and the, and the terms of the covenant is obey. Obey the law. And if you'll do this, I'll give you that land grant I promised you. And of course, the Lord knows this is not going <clears> to, <throat> they're going to fail ultimately. That's why Jesus Christ shows up and keeps the law for them. He said he'll put, their law in the, uh, put the law in their hearts or in their minds, and one day that will happen. It'll be a little bit easier. You can't do it without God. That's the whole point. In Deuteronomy 11, verse 22 to 24, he says, For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you, to, uh, command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, and to cleave unto Him. So it's not just, you know, you do it without, I mean, they're cleaving to Him. They're loving Him. Then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place whereupon, or whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, and that be the river in Egypt, uh, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. So he's telling them, if you obey me, I'll give you entire Middle East. It'll be yours. At times when he obeyed them, they expanded. At times when they disobeyed him, they contracted. The termination of this covenant, well, for us, it terminated at Calvary. Now, when I say that, you have to visit Calvary. Uh, a man that, that uh, I mean, a man that's not been saved, as far as I he's still under the law. Uh, law of conscience, which will be, there'll be plenty to condemn him just with his own conscience. If he's, never, if he's never heard the Ten Commandments in his life, it doesn't matter. He's got a conscience, and that conscience, God's written that law in his heart. Uh, Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14. It says, And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. That means to be made alive. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Anything you've done before, the, before you were saved, it's under the blood. All trespasses. Blotting out, there, now here's the blessing. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. You can't even, now under, this has to do with standing, not state. But as your standing is, you cannot even transgress again. Why? There's no law. Obviously, everybody thinks, well, I'm not under the law. I'm going to go rob a bank. What? Oh, <laughs> Your soul's not under the law before God. There's nothing that condemn you to hell. But they'll still throw you in jail. They may shoot you. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So for those of us that are saved, the Mosaic Covenant is dead to us. Okay? Now we... I think some folks think that, uh, I don't know, maybe it's the grace folk. Um, 
they think somehow that we're not under, we're not under any law. Well, we still are under law, but we're under law for testimony's sake. Is there anything you can do to lose your salvation? Nothing, right? Okay. Then what's the purpose of it? It's for testimony's sake. It's for doing right, I understand that, but it's, all, it's, it's, it's mainly for testimony's sake. It's not like not eating things, that, uh, not eating blood. Why would you do that? If you ate some blood, would you go to hell? You wouldn't dine with me anymore. No, but uh, you wouldn't go to hell. But would you do it? I wouldn't do it just because of what the Bible says about it. And plus, it doesn't sound palatable to me anyway. Um, there's something about that, um, the, eating of, uh, the eating of blood, that wine that moveth itself aright and is red in the cup. Uh, when those Jews are, are martyred in Revelation chapter 5, I believe it is, when they're, uh, when they're uh, beheaded and everything, they're going to be mingling that blood with their wine. And one, there was a, there was a, um, there was a, and I don't know if it was in Italy or where it was at, but there was a town that produced wine during the Second World War. And... They used pig's blood in it. Um, I could probably find out if I looked that up. Uh, of course, nobody knew about it, but man, when they found out. So when he talks about when the wine is red, uh, it moveth itself aright, and there's, there's something else going on there. <laughs> uh, and it has to do, has to do with uh, blood in it. Anyway, uh, they talk about their drink offerings being blood offerings. Isn't that what a Catholic believes? I need to believe after it's, you know, hocus pocus, you can eat you know. Yeah. And they believe that, that that bread becomes flesh and that wine becomes blood. Uh, I, that there's a, um, there was a documentary out and there was a movie that followed it called Alive, I believe it was called. And it was about a, a Chilean, a Chile, Chilean uh, soccer team that were flying over the Andes, I believe it was, and they, uh, the plane crashed, and they couldn't find them. Uh, they didn't know where they were at, and a good portion of them survived the plane crash, and some of them died, and of course, it's, it was uh, sub-zero up there overnight on that uh, mountain range, and they were just barely subsisting, but they had nothing to eat, and um, it didn't take them long before they were, they were uh, they were eating their uh, teammates that had died. Uh, being Roman Catholic, they easily came to that conclusion. Think about it. If the priest can do it every Sunday, why can't we? <laughs> I mean, that's what they're taught. Now, I'm not going to judge them for that. Yeah, I haven't been that hungry yet. So, But I certainly wouldn't, huh? Yes. Um, I did some research on that. The, if you look it up in, the, in a dictionary, it's about an island. Um, it's named after some type of island, but the two words, Chaldean words, in that are like, um, I'm trying to think of another example of that. And that would be priest of Baal. It has to do with the Chaldean words, uh, uh, the conjunction. What do you call that thing when you got two together? Compound. Uh, it's like um, it's like Catholic, cataholic. Who would have got that? But did you realize that those? I mean, obviously, if you look up in the dictionary, it says the word Catholic means universal. But when you break the thing down, it's someone that's wholly given to a cat. Wow. You mean like that leopard over there, Revelation chapter 13? That's what I'm saying about that word. There's two, the, the definition, you'll never find a definition as priest of Baal looking anywhere except at the two Chaldean words that go together there means priest of Baal. Or cannibals. <clears throat> All right, where was I at? Did we read Leviticus 9? Yep, we did. Okay, we're already down here. I'm sorry? 
Deuteronomy 11. Did we read it yet? Oh, okay. Verse 25. Okay. If I read 24, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done with that. Oh, we were, we're all the way down here. Yeah, we've covered Colossians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The mind's gone. Um, termination of the covenant. Well, for us, it's done away with. But for, um, but for the world, it's in full force for Israel during the tribulation period. And much of it's in force during the millennium. It, there, in Ezekiel, where you're dealing with the millennium, they're still making sa certain sacrifices. They're still making meal offerings and heave offerings and peace offerings. I mean, it, it's still going on. They're, still, they're obeying the Sabbath. Uh, they're obeying the feast. And even the Gentiles are compelled to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Once a year, they have to come up. And if they don't, there's trouble. So, you know, when we say that, uh, you know, the law's done away with, it's done away with for us. But when the millennium comes back, it's going to, I mean, or when the tribulation comes, not only is it going to be in full force. Now, let me show you that. Revelation 12, 17. <clears throat> Just think of the church as a parenthesis, or as the preacher put it, told, told me today, that the, the thing that separates the first advent and the second advent is a comma, and that's the church age. Think of... Think of us as a parenthesis or a, a, a parenthetical insert. Because once you pull it out, you can push it together and it's going to fit. And so the Mosaic Law may be done away with for us, but in the tribulation it's going to be in force. He says there, Revelation 12, 17, The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. There it is. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. See, there's the little addition. There's nothing wrong, miss, there's nothing wrong with the law, right? The Bible says it's good, it's holy, it's, I mean, it's fine. But what they missed is they missed their Messiah. So they're going to finally have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 14, 12, turn over there. Restates it, says, here is the patience of the saints. Obviously, this is not referring to the saints in this age. These are tribulation saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There you go. So, we're going to see the Mosaic Covenant come back into force during the tribulation. And matter of fact, the first thing that I believe the uh, Antichrist does is make a covenant. A seven-year covenant, says he does. And that seven-year covenant is to bring back the Mosaic Covenant. I don't think it's a covenant with death and hell. I think, I, think they've, I think that's understood. But what he wants to do is reinstitute the sacrifices. He has good reason to want to do that. Because if they reinstitute the sacrifices, what else do they need to have? They need to have the temple, don't they? And guess who wants the temple? He don't care about the sacrifices. It's a means to an end. Oh, yeah. You need, to, you, need to re, you need to reaffirm the Mosaic Covenant. He says he'll confirm the covenant for one week. He never makes it to the end of that week, by the way. He says, you need that Mosaic. You need to be making those sacrifices. That Jesus says, amen, that's right. We need to be making those sacrifices. And you need to rebuild that temple. And he goes, I'm going to help you. You go over there to Ezra and find out that where it says that the, um, the king of, of Assyria... Let me think of the verse here in Ezra. And I know I'm getting off the beaten path. Uh, is it Ezra chapter 6 or 9? I probably won't be able to find it now that I want it. Well, I'm not going to try to find it now. But he tells them that the king of Syria is going to aid them in the building. And what's interesting is, it's not the king of Assyria. It's the king of Persia. And a lot of times these, uh, king of Persia could have an Assyrian king. Just as Egypt could have a Babylonian king, or from Babylon. And 
But he says that king of Assyria is going to aid them. And that's what I think is going to happen. I think he's going to, he's going to befriend that Jew the first thing. And he's going to talk him up. And he's going to say, what you need, you, need to, you, should be, you should be making sacrifices on that altar today. And it says they'll begin the sacrifices. And in the midst of the week, after the temple's been built and ready to receive it, he stops them. So you're going to have that Mosaic Covenant big time during the tribulation, at least for the Jews, because he has every intention of them start to make those sacrifices. He, he cuts it off, and then he sits in the temple and says, I'll make my own dogs, pigs, humans. Anything he can do to defile it. That's exactly what uh, Antioch Epiphanes, I guess he cut off a dog's neck during the during that 400 years of silence, and, and he overtook Jerusalem and uh, captured the temple and supposedly uh, sacrificed a dog on the altar. Now, of course, they thought that was the fulfillment of Matthew chapter 24. That couldn't be more wrong. What does it say? You said Ezra 6 9? Nope. This says King of Assyria. Somebody find that for me. I looked at 513. That's that's not I don't think that's it. I think it's later than 513. 622. Let's see if that's it. Kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful and turned the heart, here we go, turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. And you've got, this is Persia. And that, that title, king of Assyria, is a title for the Antichrist in your Bible. He's going to help them. Anyway, I don't know how I got off on all that. We're supposed to be studying covenants, not tribulation. Huh? That's, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the, uh, well, no, we need to stop. I will finish, I'm going to try to finish up next week. I know I'm, I'm moving like a snail. Um, we'll talk about the Davidic covenant, the new covenant, and Lord willing, the, the angelic or eternal covenant is really just a, an addendum. We should be able to get through that pretty quick. Any questions about what we covered? Don't let anybody talk you. Don't let anybody talk you out of thinking that Jew's been done away with. That's that's a lot of false doctrine that's coming. It's come about in the last 10, 15, 20 years. But it's not new. It's old news. But they're bringing it back like, you know, God's done away with that Jew. God's not done done away with that Jew. He's just calling out a people for his name, calling out a bride for his son. And once he's done with that, pew, and he's going to go right back to dealing with them again. Remember, and you know that, how do you know that? Because those promises to Abraham are without any strings attached, without any um, uh, conditions. Thank you. And he will go back to that Jew. So, regardless of what the world thinks, and regardless even of what you and I think, <clears throat> just believe the scriptures. And what that means is we're not, built, we're not kingdom builders. And if you ever get close to kingdom builders, you want, the one thing kingdom builders have to do in this age is kill people. Kingdom builders kill people. And if you look at Islam, kingdom builders, they kill people. Roman Catholicism, they kill people. Whether you think so or not, you don't know your history. And you haven't looked into it. They killed a lot of people. Communism, huh? John Calvin, building his own little kingdom, started killing some folks. Communism, kingdom builders, they kill people. We're not, we save people. We don't kill them. We're told, to, we're told to get them saved. In a sense, we kill them in that sense spiritually. Or, uh, they're dead in Christ, but we're not, we're not 
trying to build anything. We're trying to, we're trying to rescue folks and get out of here. Huh? That's right. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't. No matter how good they sound, you know, listen, I, I, one, thing, one, thing about, one thing about those kind of preachers that people follow, listen, they followed Adolf Hitler because he could preach. The man had monologues that were just incredible. If you, if you didn't know the language, you're just like, I'm sitting there listening to him in German. I don't know what he's saying. And I'm like, wow. Because he had charisma. Then I look, I'm reading the thing underneath about what he's actually saying. It's not all that interesting. It's not what he said. It's how he said it. And most folks are there over what, how they hear, not what they hear. It's crazy. 